Welcome to another class on the book of Daniel. This particular lesson was presented on Thursday evening, 11th February 2021, in a Zoom class for the British Bible School as the UK continues in lockdown. We are attempting this study to be in a chronological way. This is the outline we're using and the way we're uh, planning to go about it. And this particular week, we are in our sixth lesson, which takes us to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, we're going to be looking at the vision of the ram and the goat. With the first verse of chapter 8, the text in the original language switches from Aramaic back to Hebrew. Why, we don't precisely know. The emphasis in these chapters is on what will happen in the future to the nation of Israel. So some of the scholars have suggested that with the switch back to concentrating on Israel and not on Babylon, that we have the change in language. And that could be the reason. Just to place us in our timeline, uh, that's where we were in chapter 8. Uh, it's, it's dated as being the third year the text tells us. So it's two years after we were in chapter 7, the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. Uh, that uh, Most scholars place that at 551 BC. Uh, Homer Haley in his commentary suggested 547. So it's within the, this, a few years of each other there. Daniel would be in his late 60s or early 70s by this time. So he's getting to be an, an older man. And this is his second vision, and he mentions that he, he had already had a first vision. Very early there in chapter 8, he mentions the other one. Homer Haley uh, comments on that and says, The one of the first was the vision of chapter 7, in which the four beasts were introduced, but only the fourth was discussed, for it challenged Daniel's interest and concern more than the second and the third beasts. These two were revealed in greater detail because they would play an important role in the future history of God's people. So in this particular chapter, we're going to zero in on the, that second and the third beast. And what is nice for us is they are identified by name. We know what they stand for without any shadow of a doubt. Daniel, in his vision, he's in Susa. Now, Susa, you see it circled on the map there. Susa was the capital of, uh, well, one of the capitals of Babylon. Uh, it's in the province of Elam. It's at the Ulai Canal. Uh, of course, you can see on the map there that Babylon, the main capital, has a star on it. Susa is, is there just to the east. It's about 230 miles east of Babylon, or 380 kilometers east of Babylon. It was a winter resident for Persian kings, we know, during the Achaemenid period. The language of verse 2 seems to suggest that Daniel may not have been physically present in Susa, but only saw himself there in the vision. However, the Hebrew is difficult, and some have concluded that possibly even the first four words of verse 2 are a later addition uh, that of the Adoshan. That's what the Net Bible study notes uh, tells us. So about 230 miles east of Babylon. There were several uh, capital cities of the Babylonian Empire. Some suggest that Susa was the location of the Summer Palace, that it became the winter capital then of Medo-Persia. Most commentators take the view, the exception is Albert Barnes, but most commentators take the view that Daniel was only in Susa in the vision, not actually in person. Very similar, if you remember, to Ezekiel's vision. Ezekiel being taken to Jerusalem in his vision. Um, if you want to know more about Ezekiel, Again, we refer you to the YouTube channel, the British Bible School YouTube channel, and there's a, a series of, of 13 lessons on the book of the prophet Ezekiel. The Uli, where Daniel okay. sees the Uli, which is where Daniel sees himself in the vision, 
was a wide man-made irrigation canal near Susa. Daniel, in his vision, sees a ram standing on the bank of the canal. This ram has two horns. One is higher than the other, with the higher one coming up last. Homer Haley says that Daniel was impressed with that the higher horn came up after the other. One should realize that a matter can be presented in a vision which cannot be manifested in reality. Each horn came up while the viewer watched. So it seems that as he's watching this ram, one horn comes up and then a larger one, a higher one comes up after that one, which doesn't happen in real life that way. But in a vision, things like that can happen. The ram charged westward, charged northward, charged southward, and no beast could withstand it or stop it. And the ram did what he wanted and became great. As Daniel considered this, a male goat, uh, the Hebrew literary there is a he-goat of the goats, came from the west across the earth without touching the ground. And it would seem that speed is what is indicated there. It's moving so fast his legs don't even touch the ground. This goat has a horn, a conspicuous horn between his eyes. I think the idea is that horn was very easily seen. It would have looked, I guess, something like a goat unicorn sort of animal. But he ran at the ram with raging strength. Uh, some translations there have powerful wrath. Strikes the ram and broke off the ram's two horns. The ram then had no power to stand, was cast to the ground and trampled on. No one could rescue the ram. The goat then became very strong, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and four conspicuous horns came up towards the four winds. The goat of heaven. Out of them came a little horn, then, we don't have that in our photograph there, but a little horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south and east towards the beautiful glorious land it grew very great even to the army or the host your translation may have of heaven we'll talk about that in a minute it threw some of the stars to the ground and trampled on them now this word host that many, many translations have even some more of the modern translations have retained host the english standard version the uh, new international version the New Revised Standard Version still have host. The latest New American Standard Version, the 2020 edition, does use army, as does the Net Bible and the New Century Version and the uh, Contemporary English Version. Uh, the Common English Bible uses heavenly forces, and the New Living Translation has heaven's army. Uh, the word literally means army. The Net Bible Study notes comments that traditionally, it's been translated host. The term refers to God's heavenly angelic assembly, which he, which he sometimes leads into battle as an army. Uh, so, yeah, the, the word there, uh, host, yeah, it would more literally be an army. In Greek, in the New Testament, when we're talking about uh, what happened at Jesus' birth, and there appeared to them, in our tra most translations, a host of, of angels. The Greek word there is stadia. And that word there means army. That's what it means. So we have this idea of, a, of an army of angels that were there when Jesus was born. Which to me makes some sense because um, the Messiah coming into the world as a baby needs all the protection it can get. It. But I digress. But the host here refers to army. But this, this little horn acted arrogantly against the prince of the army. Again, Net Bible Study Notes commented that the prince of the army may refer to God, uh, cross-referencing whose sanctuary later in the verse, or it could be to the angel Michael, it suggests. Uh, we're going to meet him in chapter 12. 
Uh, the regular burnt offering was taken away and the place of God's sanctuary was overthrown. By the way, there's another idea about who the prince of the army is. We'll talk about that when we get later on down in the text. But an army was given over along with the regular burnt offering because of this sinful rebellion. Again, the Net Bible Study Notes had this. The Hebrew has in the course of rebellion. The meaning of the phrase is difficult to determine. It could mean due to rebellion, uh, referring to the failure of the Jews, and there's lots of scholars that take that view. But the Net Bible Study Note says this is not likely since it's not a point made elsewhere in the book. And it could be right. The phrase, more probably, it says, refers to the rebellion against God and the atrocities against the Jews by the little horn. And so that may be the idea there, or there could be the Jews' sins. And uh, there is, as we're going to see, there was a lot of Jewish sin going on during this time period, but we'll get to that. It would, this little horn would throw truth to the ground and enjoy success. It acted and it prospered. The truth, by the way, most likely refers to God's law, the Torah, that it throws to the ground and tramples on it. We'll see an application of that as we get into the interpretation of the dream later on down in the chapter. Daniel then heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one asked the one who spoke how long the sanctuary <clears throat> would be overthrown and offerings not offered. The reply was, for 2,300 evenings and mornings. Um, that's an interesting phrase. Again, going to the net Bible study notes. The language of evenings and mornings is reminiscent of the creation account of Genesis 1. Since evening and morning is the equivalent of a day, the reference here would be to 2,300 days. However, some interpreters understand the reference to be to the evening sacrifice and the morning sacrifice, in which case the reference would be to only 1,150 days. Either way, the event that marked the commencement of this period is unclear. So we've got a couple of different ideas. We'll talk in more detail about those again later on in this lesson. But this, then the sanctuary... Once these 2,300 evenings and mornings are gone, the sanctuary would be put right again. It would re be restored to its rightful state. The Hebrew literally there would be translated, the, the sanctuary, will, sanctuary will be vindicated or the sanctuary will be justified. When Daniel saw this vision, he wanted to understand it. And who wouldn't? A person appeared before him that looked like a man. And Daniel heard a voice come out of the air between the banks of the Uli. Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. And he sees, in the human form, Gabriel. Well, Gabriel is a messenger from God. This is the first time, by the way, that a, one of God's messengers is identified by name. Now, we know Gabriel more from his appearances in Luke's account of Jesus' birth. In Luke chapter 1, verse 19, we read that he appeared to Zechariah, told him about John's impending birth, uh, introduced himself, by the way, there as one who stands in the presence of God. We get to chapter, uh, down to chapter, uh, and still in chapter 1, ch verse 26. Uh, he appeared to Mary in Nazareth to let her know that she was pregnant with the Messiah. But Gabriel comes over to Daniel in this vision, and Daniel fell on his face, terrified. Gabriel told him to understand that the vision was for the time of the end. It was not for Daniel's time. Daniel fell into a trance the Net Bible has, some translations, a deep sleep on the ground. I don't think he just fell asleep. Uh, the, pro the idea seems to be that he was stunned or even passed out, that he fainted. Young, in his translation of this, states that, he, that Daniel swooned. He swooned. 
and uh, the idea seems to be that he passed out. He fainted. Uh, Gabriel touched him, brings him back, makes him stand up. He told him that he would make known to him what would be in the latter time of wrath. And he told him that this vision was about the appointed time of the end. Then we see that phrase, of the end. We should be asking ourselves the question, what end is this talking about? What is the appointed time of the end? Now, when most people today hear that phrase, they seem to automatically think about the end of the world. But as we're going to see, this could not be the correct application because of the time frame that this vision gives. It identifies who's the world power at the time, and that was a long time ago. So we're going to see it's not the end of the world. It is the end of something um, that is not specifically specified yet, although in a few verses we're going to read about what's that this is happening towards the end of a kingdom. So that would seem to be the end that is in mind here. The time of the end of that kingdom seems to be the idea. Homer Haley writes that <clears throat> the time of the end is not the end of time, but according to the context, it would be the end of the judgment of God against the transgression of the law by the Jews, expressed in the 2,300 days of verse 14. F.W. Ferrer said, But since Daniel still lay prostrate on his face and sank into a swoon, the angel touched him and raised him up and said that the great wrath was only for a fixed time, and he would tell him what would happen at the end of it. And so he takes the position that, that the time of the end is the end of the time of God's wrath. And that very well could be the idea. But this is speaking of a time, it's after the captivity of the Jews in Babylon, when it would seem that they would become wicked again. I think that's a valid idea here. And that God would pour out his anger on them. The righteous would be hurt, but this would serve to refine them and bring them back to God. That's the take that Pharaoh has. I think it's a, it's a good idea here. This is the chart we used in our last lesson. So let's, la add, let's add in chapter 8. And there we have chapter 8. And it fits in uh, the ram with the two horns. We, it's identified in our text as being the kings of Media and Persia. That fits into the chest of silver that we saw in Daniel chapter 2, as well as the bear we saw in the previous chapter. And there, by the way, there's no doubt about it that this ram is Medo-Persia, because that's what Gabriel says it is in verse 20. He tells him this is Medo-Persia. I do find it interesting that the year of this vision would be the same year that Cyrus set up the joint Medo-Persian kingdom. So <clears throat> this is very, very current stuff as Daniel is viewing it. That one horn was higher and behind the other would represent that the Persian part was later, but more the more powerful part of the kingdom. And the Persians, we know historically, came from the east, pushed west, north, south, just like the, the vision had the ram doing. So it very much fits Medo-Persia. In fact, it tells us that it's Medo-Persia. Homer Haley wrote that the greatness of this beast began with Cyrus, whom God raised up as his shepherd and anointed, before whom, before whom he was removing all barriers. It refers us to Isaiah 44 and 45. It was probable that through this vision, the prophet's knowledge of Isaiah's writings, he began to realize that the time of deliverance from bondage and return of the captive to their homeland was drawing near. Uh, the exile is almost over, and with Medo-Persia, that was going to happen under Cyrus. The male goat, or some translations have the shaggy goat, is identified for us in the text as the king of Greece. So, again, that relates to the Daniel chapter 2, the torso of bronze. Daniel chapter 7, 
the leopard with four heads and four wings, eventually four heads, four wings. Um, and so, again, there's no doubt that this is what it is. It's Greece. That's what Gabriel told Daniel. Hebrew word, by the way, there is Yavan, J-A-V-A-N, which is what we call Greece today. So this, this is Greece. The king here is equivalent to the kingdom, although at the initial stage it would seem to be referring to the first ruler of Greece as it became an empire. Again, the Net Bible Study notes, the goat of Daniel's vision represents Greece. The large horn represents Alexander the Great. The ram stands for Media Persia. Alexander's rapid conquest of the Persians involved three battles of major significance that he won against overwhelming odds. Granicus in 334 BC, Esus in 333 BC, and Guagemala in 331 BC. So that great horn between the goat's, goat's eyes is that first king, Alexander the Great. And by the way, the goats uh, moving so fast its feet doesn't touch the ground would very well be represented in Alexander in his very swift conquering of the world. The fury, though, is very reminiscent as well. Homer Haley uh, had this to say. Alexander's fury and that of his army was the pent-up rage from years of smarting under the invasions of the Persian emperors. At the age of 20, upon the death of his father Philip, Alexander inherited a kingdom. The attempts of the Persians to conquer the Greeks had been thwarted, was thwarted by two decisive battles. Darius the Great, again this is 160 years before Alexander, but Darius the Great was defeated at the Battle of Marathon. And Xerxes was defeated in a sea battle off the coast of Salamis 10 years later. But these invasions of the Persians account for the fury of the he-goat. The Persians were constantly invading and harassing Greece. And so when Alexander gets the chance, his fury is taken out on Medo-Persia. Warren Wearsby commented that, however, the remarkable conquests of Alexander were more than battle trophies, for they accomplished God's purposes in the world and helped to prepare the world for the coming of Christ and the spread of the gospel. By extending Greek culture and language, he helped to bring peoples together, and eventually the common or Koine Greek became the language of the New Testament. I think Wearsby points out something that's very important for us to remember, that God is still using these world empires, and he's preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. And Alexander contributed to that, in particular, by the language, the Koine Greek, in which the New Testament was written in, which the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, initially was proclaimed in. This male goat acting even more arrogantly, as the text said, that's seen very much in the last year of Alexander's life. Uh, Homer Haley says, The conquest of the ram by the he-goat led the goat to magnify himself exceedingly. In the last year of his life, Alexander appeared to ask Greek states uh, to treat him as divine. So, He'd really become one to magnify himself exceedingly, as, as the translation that Haley quotes from says. By the way, ZPEB, the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible, and this is volume one, published in 1998, that Homer Haley was, was quoting from. Uh, he goes on to comment about Alexander. He says, Alexander was a devoted advocate of Greek philosophy and religion. As a result of his time spent conquering Tyre and Palestine en route to Egypt, he greatly influenced the Jews, especially the young priests. These accepted many of the Greek customs, much of their lifestyles, and their religious influences. This led to increased corruption of morals and transgressions of the law. You know, Alexander may have contributed uh, the common language, 
but he also led the Jews away from God. The lifestyle was appealing and the religious influences as well. When the horn was broken in the vision, four other horns arose, and these would represent the four kingdoms which would arise out of Alexander's one nation, but they wouldn't have his power. Alexander died while still a young man. He was only about 32 or 33 years old. John Lennox writes, the defeat of the ram by the male goat anticipates the battle of Isis in 333 BC, in which Alexander defeated the armies of Darius III. Ten years later, aged 32 and at the height of his powers, Alexander died in Babylon in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, probably entirely unaware that a man in that very same city had written a prophecy about him three, nearly 300 years earlier. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? That he dies where Daniel was serving and writing this account. Following Alexander's death, the kingdom was divided up by four of his generals. Now, Bible study note says that the four conspicuous horns refer to Alexander's successors. After his death, Alexander's empire was divided up among four of his generals. Cassander, who took Macedonia and Greece, L L Lysimachus, who took Thrace and parts of Asia Minor, Seleucus, who took Syria and territory to its east, and Ptolemy, who took control of Egypt. And here's a map that shows these areas. Um, the entire bit would have been, the entire colored in bits, not, not the the sort of sandy color, would have been Alexander's empire. And after his death, uh, the darker red in the south there, Egypt, uh, goes to Ptolemy. Uh, we've got uh, Syria, uh, the green in uh, old Babylon. Originally, Antigonus had this area, quickly defeated by, by Seleucus, um, or Seleucus. And uh, that is um, very much the uh, uh, area there in the green. Uh, then we have Greece and Macedonia, that's in your upper left, uh, the orange area, that's where Cassander had his. And then Thracia and Bithynia, that's the purple in between the orange and the green. Uh, Lysimachus had that. By the way, this one doesn't seem to have lasted long as an independent sort of kingdom and seems to have been swallowed up historically by Cassander and Macedonia. And we've got the uh, the sheep image that I had from a, another commentary there um, that uh, showed the four horns, Egypt, Syria, Thrace, and Macedonia. And that's historically what, what happened. Now, the land of Israel was between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, and they fought over it. You can see Judah there in the very center of our picture, Gaza, Jerusalem, um, Joppa, Samaria, Shechem, uh, all, all those areas there, it constantly fought over. Initially, it was under the Ptolemies, and as this is reflected in this map here in, in the reddish color. Um, and apparently, the Ptolemies treated the Jews kindly. But in 198 BC, they were uh, defeated by the Seleucids, who then uh, gained control over the land of Israel. At the latter end of their kingdom, a king of rash and deceitful, and was deceitful. Uh, Hebrew has it was a king of strong face. Uh, would arise. This is the little horn that was mentioned earlier in this chapter. Uh, this is not the little horn, by the way, of chapter seven, as that little horn was from the fourth kingdom, it was from Rome. This little horn is from the third kingdom, and that's Greece. Uh, this little little horn would be historically Antiochus IV Epiphanes. We know him as Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, the Bible study notes tells us this small horn is Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who controlled the Seleucid kingdom from around 175 to 164 BC. Antiochus was extremely hostile toward the Jews and persecuted them mercilessly. 
he gave himself the name Epiphanes, which means the bright and shining one. He considered himself Theos Epiphanes, and some translate that as the manifest or the shining or the bright God. He looked on himself as an incarnated manifestation of the Olympian Zeus. Now, he called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Apparently, a lot of other people did too. The Jews, though, uh, used a play on words. They called him Antiochus Epimenes. Uh, Epimenes, not Epiphanes, Epimenes. Uh, literally, Antiochus the Crazy One. Uh, he even had the word Theos, the Greek word Theos, God put on the coins minted with his likeness. This is one of them here. I found this on uh, Wikimedia Commons. This coin, by the way, if you can read the Greek letters on the right-hand side, uh, reads, King Antiochus, God manifest, bearer of victory. Uh, so that that's Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, you can read, by the way, more about him in 1 Maccabees, in the Apocrypha. If you've never read 1 Maccabees, I would encourage you to do so. It contains a good history of the Jews during this time period and the rebellion against Antiochus led by the, the Maccabees. Uh, Second Maccabees as well deals with some of this. So those are well worth reading. But Antiochus, he robbed temples in Persia. He marched on Egypt, but the Romans kept him out of Egypt. Uh, he then brutally attacked Jerusalem. He desecrated the temple. He killed many of the Jews. F.W. Ferrer said that he extended his power towards the south by intriguing and warring against Egypt and his young nephew, Ptolemy Philometor and towards the sun rising by his successes in the direction of Media and Persia, and towards the glory or ornament, uh, towards the Holy Land. Inflated with insolence, he now set himself against the stars, the host of heaven, i.e. against the chosen people of God and their leaders. That's how he interprets the stars and the host of heaven, the army of heaven. He cast down and trampled on them, and defied the prince of the host. We know historically he instigated the most vindictive religious persecution of the pre-Christian era. Homer Haley wrote that his ambition was to Hellenize his subject provinces, but Judea stood in his way. The nation and its culture had to be destroyed, and this he was determined to do. It was when the transgressions of the Jews came to the full end. God never executed his judgments for a nation until the cup of its people's iniquity reached a point beyond which God could no longer tolerate them. He refers you to Genesis 15, 16. Uh, Antiochus, the little horn, would have great power. He would cause terrible destruction. The Hebrew literally there says, extraordinarily he will destroy. It was indeed. He would be successful in what he did, destroying powerful people and the people of the Holy Ones, the people of the saints. He would be destroying the Jews. John Lennox tells us that they, the Jews he's talking about found Greek culture and lifestyle very attractive. It made far fewer moral demands than the law of Moses, for instance, and it allowed them to give free reign to their impulses and desires. It also opened up a whole new world of entertainment and sport that had been foreign to them, to say nothing of the intellectual stimulation of the free exchange of ideas without having to be committed to any particular world view. It was not only some of the ordinary people that welcomed the wave of Hellenization, but a group of the leaders led by no less than Jason the high priest who had abandoned any sense that their Bible, our Old Testament, was a definitive revelation from God. And maybe you can see hints of that at some things that are happening in the supposed Christian world today. And we'll make some of that application later. So we have this idea of the army of heavens as well as the stars here. And this would seem to be the casting down of some of, the, of these, would seem to be a reference 
to the people of God by the, the army. And I think that is a good idea here, not of star of angels, but of of the of the Jews. And also the priest uh, representing the stars, uh, the Jewish leaders. And stars symbolize great earthly leaders in Joel as well as in Isaiah. Although some believe that the prince of the army is referring to God himself. Uh, the New American Standard Bible, at least the 1995 edition, uh, applies this in its translation to God. And maybe that's right. Um, but we do know that God's people are referred to as an army, as hosts. Uh, in Exodus chapter 7 and chapter 12, the beautiful land that we find here uh, is a reference is a reference uh, to the land of Israel, where God's people live, the land that's described as the land of milk and honey. Uh, this little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes, he would succeed through deceit. He was treacherous. He was cunning as well. He was also arrogant. In his mind, he would become great. History, history tells us that Antiochus was known for concealing what he really meant under ambiguous words. We find politicians and people today who do that, don't they? Using ambiguous words, so you'll think he means one thing, when in reality he means something else. But he would destroy many without warning, who were not aware of his deceitfulness. And without warning, he would rise up against the prince of princes. Um, possibly here referring to God, and very well could be referring to God there. I think it probably is. He's going to try to take on God himself. And we know that he did blaspheme God, uh, that he heaped on God all kinds of insults. And he caused what happened daily in the temple to cease. Uh, back up in verse 12, it mentioned that. Um, it doesn't tell us what happened daily there in verse 12, although our translations will put something in. The original Hebrew text does not have anything. Um, usually we have put either, either put in burnt offering or sacrifice. Those are not in the original text, but that is probably what is being referred to. John Lennox writes that like Nebuchadnezzar and many others before and after him, Antiochus could not tolerate people who would not bow down to him. He was determined to break their spirit. So, not content with banning the sacrifices, he proceeded to ban the reading of the law of Moses. You now we have the truth being uh, thrown down in the division. Um, he ordered that all copies of it should be collected and burned. He went further and banned even the observance of the law on penalty of death. In particular, he outlawed the Jewish practice of circumcision, even going to the extent of murdering Jewish babies who had been circumcised, hanging them around the necks of their mothers, and hurling them down from the walls of Jerusalem. You get just a flavor of what Antiochus Epiphany did. Uh, he was a dreadful ruler. Josephus, the apocryphal books of Maccabees, tell about Antiochus' de desecration of the temple, where he erected an idol of Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem. He rededicated the temple to Zeus. He offered sacrifices there to Zeus. He put in his own priests. And then he polluted the temple with pig broth, as well as sacrificing a pig on the altar. If you remember, pigs were unclean to the Jews. But he stopped the worship of God in the temple. Uh, Lennox comments that on the way back from one of his campaigns against Egypt, he invaded Jerusalem and deliberately desecrated the Jewish temple by entering the holy place and removing the golden altar where the high priest prayed and the golden lampstand together with many of the precious vessels and of gold 
and silver. But the reason that he's going to be allowed to do all of this, again, it depends on your interpretation here, but I think this does make sense, is the sin of the people of Israel. But he is going to be broken. Not by a human hand. It's going to be due to God. Um, one thing Antiochus did that he really wasn't, I don't think, expecting was he caused a rebellion amongst the Jews. And the Jews rose up against him. John Lennox tells us, but Antiochus had failed to reckon with the depth of the anger he had provoked. That anger erupted in what we now call the Maccabean Revolt, after its leader, Judas Maccabeus, or Judas the Hammer. Judas was one of five sons of a priest, Mattathias, who lived in Modium, a village about 17 miles from Jerusalem. It was Mattathias himself who lit the flame of resistance, by killing a Jew who was about to offer a sacrifice to pagan gods, as well as a king's officer who was present. And at this point in the vision, we find that God's interest in Greece ends. Antiochus dies and God's interest is no longer there. Uh, Antiochus would die, not killed by anyone as we mentioned, but that seems to be letting us know that God was behind his death. And historically, he died a few months after the rebellion in which they retook the temple and then they rededicated it to the worship of God. He died a few months after that. Apparently, history tells us, from a mental disorder. He died at Tebe in Persia. The vision ends with the cleansing of the sanctuary. Um, history tells us that this took place on the 15th of December, probably 165, some suggest 164, depending on how you, you, you date your years there. Uh, this uh, cleansing of the temple, the rededication of it, is re uh, still remembered by Jews today in the festival of Hanukkah. Uh, this is one of the Jewish festivals that was observed during the time of Jesus. The three festivals we read about in the law are Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, Passover in April, Pentecost in May, Tabernacles, I believe, was in October. But uh, during the exile, there were two more festivals added, and they are Purim and Hanukkah. And Hanukkah, we have a reference to that Jesus went to Jerusalem for it. It's called the Feast of Dedication. In John chapter 10, you read about that beginning at verse 22. So it, this is where all this vision ends, that the temple was rededicated. Let me say just a word about the 2,300 evenings and mornings. Uh, if these are literal days, that would be six years, 140 days, based on a 360-day um, uh, year. Uh, and some have suggested that that fits here, uh, referring to the period from 170 to 164, a period of about six years, from Antiochus beginning of his persecution of the Jews until his death, although it's not possible to work it out to the exact day. Others think it is half that time, 1,150 days, which would be three years and 70 days. Um, they suggest that this is the time when Antiochus seized Jerusalem until the temple was cleansed in a successful revolt of the Jews led by the Maccabees, a period of about three years. Again, it's, it's not possible to pinpoint it to exact days here. Uh, some have also suggested that the idea of evenings and mornings, um, maybe that's referring to the sacrifices, because there's an evening sacrifice and a morning sacrifice, that was stopped. Some have also suggested maybe that's a Jewish day um, because of the Jewish days. Jewish day is referred to as an evening and a morning. All right, some have suggested that it's half that. So uh, it depends on where you want to go with that. Wearsby, I think, puts all this in perspective very nicely. But what is the starting point for the countdown? 
The six-year advocates begin with 171 BC when Antiochus deposed the true high priest. Subtract six years, six years this takes you to 165 when Judas Maccabeus defeated the enemy and reconsecrated the temple. However, the three-year advocates begin with the establishment of the pagan altar in the temple on the 25th of Kislev, 168. This takes us to 165. Either approach meets the requirements of the prophecy. So whether it's six or whether it's three, it fits up pretty well. Notice that Daniel was told to seal up the vision, uh, seal it up. And why? Because it's not going to happen for a long time. The fulfillment was not for another 300 to 350 years. Now, keep this point in mind. He was to seal this up because it was a long for a long time in the future. We made this point when we studied Revelation about John's being told not to seal up his vision. If you want to learn more about that, again, I refer you again to the British Bible School YouTube channel. And there are 12, 12 lessons there on Revelation, which I taught back in the autumn of 2020. But the main point in this vision would seem to be this. Although it would get bad for the Jews once again, and I think it's because of their sin, God was still in control. God would take care of the one who blasphemed him. At the end of this vision, Daniel was left exhausted and worn out and lay sick in bed for days. See, these visions of bad times ahead had a very bad effect on Daniel. Homer Haley writes, um, concludes for us, Although full comprehension of what lay ahead for the people of God may not have been understood by Daniel, yet certain matters were clear. There would be three more world empires beyond the Babylonian kingdom under whose domination the people of God would live. In the days of the third empire, the king of fierce countenance would set his mind and hand to destroy the concept of Jehovah, of his people, of his temple, and the divine system of worship and of his law. Add this vision and its suffering to that of the fourth empire of the earlier vision, the realization of the terrible days that lay ahead left him, left Daniel, faint and sick. But he did then afterwards get up and continue doing the king's business, but the vision appalled him. Uh, he couldn't understand all of it, but he knew that bad things were going to happen. So, what is there in this that we can learn as Christians living in the 21st century? Uh, I think undoubtedly we can see that God is in control. We've mentioned that in every lesson. And I think this again shows that God is in control. Yes, there may be some bad times ahead, but God is going to take care of it. And we can see that God knows the future. We saw that in our in chapter 7 as well. God knew the future of what was going to happen in the world and how it was going to affect his people. But we can also see through all this, and we mentioned this in chapter 7 as well, that God would take care of his people. He didn't forget them. Um, another lesson I think we can, we can see here is not to allow the world to tempt us from following God, as many of the Jews did by the Greeks. Uh, John Lennox mentioned this, and he wrote this. The concept of freedom is shared by many people today and given as their reason for abandoning God. They say that God is out to stifle them, their self-expression, their creativity, and their flourishing. They want freedom from any authority above that of man. And they think that secular society can deliver it to them. It's such a good parallel with our society today who want to give up God because they want to flourish. They think the secular, a secular society can add to their lives. Sad that that idea is still around today. A fifth lesson. Uh, we live in a world, again, that's not dissimilar to what the Jews went through as rulers tried to eliminate God and his people. 
And we see that today, don't we? Like them, we need to remain faithful no matter what might happen. Again, John Lennox talked about that. This quote is noticed it's from two different sections, but he's talking about the same thing, so I'll put them together. If we, we replace the state-enforced pagan culture of Seleucid times by the state atheism of more recent times, the motives that drove Antiochus are still very much alive. And he goes on to say, then there is an increase in aggressive atheism at the intellectual and propagandist level. In secularized Western societies, there is massive pressure to marginalize, if not exterminate, religious belief. And we see that today, don't we? The laws of nations are increasingly being used to discriminate against believers. And you don't have to look very far in the, the media, in the news, to see this happening. One final lesson is that we need to be a people of truth. Uh, truth was trampled on in the vision. But God's people are always to be a people of truth. And again, John Lennox comments, The relation of power to truth is very important, particularly in the contemporary world where there is a strong current of postmodern relativism, an attitude that has its roots in ancient Greek skepticism. Many people are far more interested in their own feelings or what works for them than in the question of what is actually true. But there's a price to be paid for rejecting the truth. And there is a price to be paid, isn't there? May we always be a people of truth. If you're following these lessons as we post them onto our YouTube channel, please note that there will not be a lesson posted next week. The next lesson will go up on Friday the 26th of February when we will be in chapter 5. There's not going to be a class next week. So uh, we'll continue this study in a few weeks' time. But let me thank you for watching, taking the time to watch this lesson. Hopefully it was of some use as we looked at this vision of Daniel.